Hello, and welcome to this lecture entitled The Great War in the Heart of Dixie, the Alabama Home Front in World War I. Much of the information in this talk comes from this book, published by the University of Alabama Press in 2008, The Great War in the Heart of Dixie, Alabama during World War I, of which I am the editor. This is a collection of essays, not a monograph. Let's look at the beginnings of World War I. World War I has its roots in the late 1800s. Prussia humiliated France in the Franco-Prussian War of 1871. And in 1882, the new German Empire allied with the Austro-Hungarian Empire and Italy. Those are the teal-colored uh, countries on this map. In 1904, England and France negotiated an end to their colonial differences and entered what's called the Entente Cordiale. Then in 1907, English and Russians negotiated their colonial differences the same way and created the Triple Entente. Those are the purple countries that you see on this map. Now let's look at this new map. When war broke out in August 1914, Italy refused to enter the war on the side of the Central Powers and switched to the Allies in May of 1915. The Ottoman Empire joined Germany and Austria in October 1914, and Bulgaria joined in October 1915 to create the Central Powers, as we see here, versus the triple or quadruple entente of the Allies that you see in green. Neutral countries in this map are shown in purple. The German battle plan was developed in 1905 to quickly crush the French. It's called the Schlieffen Plan for this general who you see here, who died in 1913. The plan was to take large numbers of German troops and make this big sweeping motion from Germany through France, encircling Paris and winning the war very quickly. However, at the first Battle of the Marne, this plan was stopped cold. This led to the trench warfare that we're all familiar with. The First Battle of the Marne um, happened on September 5th through 12th, 1914, a little over a month after the beginning of the war. We all know how the Great War began. The Balkans had been a hot spot since the 1880s, and in 1812 and 13, there were two wars that involved Serbia. There were additional diplomatic crises and small wars that had set Europe on edge for about 15 years. In late June 1914, Austrian Archduke and heir to the throne, Franz Ferdinand and his wife Sophie visited Sarajevo, Bosnia's capital where their motorcade was attacked unsuccessfully by Bosnian assassins armed with grenades. When a grenade exploded in the crowd and injured about 20 people, Franz Ferdinand insisted that he wanted to go visit the wounded, but his car took the medieval back streets that weren't big enough for his limousine, and his car stalled when it tried to correct a wrong turn by backing up. At that moment, Gavrilo Princips, a 19-year-old assassin who was a Bosnian revolutionary paid by Serbian secret police, jumped onto the running board and killed both Ferdinand and Sophie. Princips was sentenced to 20 years in prison. He was too young to be executed. He died in 1918 in an Austrian prison at age 24. He had contracted tuberculosis, and it had affected his bones. They had to amputate his arm uh, prior to his death. Nevertheless, he passed away. On July 28, 1914, Austria declared war on Serbia, and on August 1st, 
Germany declared war on Russia. This is because of interlocking alliances. Thus, the Great War began. By the time of the armistice on November 11th, 1918, 56 nations had declared war against one another. Not all of those nations were in Europe. Now, the U.S. did not enter the war until April 6, 1917. And, of course, with it, the state of Alabama entered the war. Alabama's first contribution to the war effort was military units. That happened because the 4th Alabama National Guard had returned from the Mexican punitive expedition in March of 1917. These troops were federalized in April 1917 and sent for a few weeks to guard infrastructure in Alabama and Tennessee. They were mustered into the regular army in August as the 167th Regiment of the 42nd or Rainbow Division, and they trained at Camp Mills, New York, under Colonel William Screws, who you see here, who was their National Guard commander as well. The 167th went to France. They first encountered the Germans at the Battle of Croix Rouge Farm during the Second Battle of the Marne, July 15th and 16th, 1918. Other Alabamians went to the 1st, or uh, I'm sorry, to the 31st, or Dixie Division, and they spent much of the war at Camp Wheeler in Georgia training. They were deployed, but they had not reached the battlefront by the time of the armistice. They were still in port at Brest. Alabama draftees who were not in these original National Guard units or infantry division, were inducted into different units. For example, four young men from Tallahassee that I follow in a different line of research uh, were all inducted into the 81st Division on May 24th, 1918. They were draftees. Okay, so the 167th returned to Alabama in May of 1919. Units of the 161st paraded in Huntsville, Decatur, and Gadsden, and then the entire regiment paraded in Birmingham, Mobile, Montgomery. Then they went over to Camp Shelby, Mississippi, where they were mustered out of service. Although earlier authors have written that about 95,000 Alabamians served in the military and that 6,262 died, Recent scholarship leads us to believe that about 89,000 actually served and that 2,530 died. This is still not a completely settled question. Alabama received benefits from World War I, particularly from federal spending. The state hosted units that trained in camps secured by representatives Dent and Blackman. Possibly the most important training camp in Alabama was Camp Sheridan in Montgomery. It was built at Vandiver Park on the Lower Wetumpka Road, the former site of the Alabama State Fair and the assembly camp for the 4th Alabama National Guard. And you'll see it here. Congressman Stanley Dent, who you see on this slide, was responsible for securing Sheridan for Montgomery and also for freezing out Mobile and Birmingham, which were uh, vying for the camp. The contract between Montgomery and the Army for the camp was signed on June 25th, 1917, and ground was broken on July 23rd of 1917. Let me show you a photo of the entrance to the camp that was taken in November of 2013, and you can see the uh, monument and the uh, historical marker. 30,000 Ohio troops with the 37th Infantry Division, the Buckeye Division, were the first to train in Camp Sheridan. They arrived between late August and October of 1917. The camp had room for 3,000 tents. The Montgomery population at that time was 40,000, so these 30,000 Ohio troops were a boon that reduced the sting of the camp being named for a Yankee. The monthly payroll was $1.38 million, which in 2023 is the equivalent of 
$31.5 million, that's the monthly payroll, and the annual anticipated income to Montgomery was $16 million in 2023, that would be worth $365 million. Sheridan also had what's called a remount depot that over the course of two years handled 17,300 horses and mules. It was staffed by 298 veterinary officers and enlisted men. There was a rifle range about 12 miles northeast of the camp and there was an artillery range two miles beyond the rifle range. Montgomerians were so excited about the economic possibilities of training troops that they put aside their lost cause pride and welcomed these northerners from Ohio. One wag named R.L. Carey published a poem on the front page of the Montgomery Advertiser of October 3rd, 1917. The last stanza sums up the welcome. Hello, Buckeyes, howdy do, derned if we ain't proud of you. Going out to France to fight, armored only with the right. Going where the shrapnel falls, going where the old flag calls. Sons of men who wore the blue, Alabama welcomes you. This uh, may or may not give you an idea of the quality of literature coming from Alabama. The 37th deployed to France in June of 1918. It was replaced by the 9th Infantry Division, but the 9th never deployed. It was being shipped to the entrepot, uh, to its port, when the armistice uh, occurred. The 9th was mustered in at Camp Sheridan on July 18, 1918, and mustered out at Camp Sheridan on February 15, 1918, with no overseas service. Our particular interest in the 9th Infantry Division is one of the lieutenants of the 67th Regiment. His name is F. Scott Fitzgerald. His training captain in Kansas, Dwight D. Eisenhower, thought of him as being more interested in writing a novel than soldiering, and indeed, he became something of a better novelist than he ever was as a soldier. On July 15, 1918, three days before the 9th was mustered into federal service, Fitzgerald met the young daughter of an Alabama Supreme Court justice. Her name was Zelda Sayre, and he courted her over the next couple of years. He finally had to kind of dragoon her into marrying him. Fitzgerald's novella, Last of the Bells, which is available online and was written in 1929, recounts many instances in his Montgomery courtship with Zelda. Now, he had to court her for a couple of years because she was the most eligible, unmarried young lady in high society in Montgomery at the time. The pictures you see here of her are from her high school yearbook and a little bit thereafter, I believe the summer that they met. She was 18 years old at that time. Fitzgerald's competition for Zelda's attention came from pilot cadets stationed at Montgomery's uh, Taylor Field near the community of Pike Road, about 10 miles outside of Montgomery. Taylor Field was the only air service station in Alabama. It opened in April 1918 with over 100 planes, the Standard J or the J-1, mounted with a Hall Scott engine that had the annoying habit of bursting into flame for no apparent reason. In, uh, this was a real problem. In one week, May 31st to June 4th, two pilots died because of engine fires. One put his plane into a dive and climbed out of the cockpit. He extinguished the flames, but he could not climb back in before the plane hit the ground. And of course, these things happen with everybody watching. The commander immediately shut the airfield down and replaced the J-1s with the Curtis J-4Ns the Jennies that are showed here, and he had the field up and running uh, in a month with a much safer, much better uh, airplane, much more forgiving for student pilots. Taylor Field was paired with 
Repair Depot number three that was two miles west of downtown Montgomery, 13 miles from Taylor Field. Uh, Repair Depot 3 was on the Alabama River at the old Wright Brothers Flying School near Montgomery. And that field survived the war and in 1922 became the hub of Maxwell Air Force Base today. Here's a picture of uh, Governor Charles Henderson, the first governor of Alabama to fly in an airplane with pilot Ross L. Smith. And you can see that uh, Henderson has this big smile on his face. Um, he's probably happy that he got back down in one piece. Uh, Ross had, uh, Smith had flown him over Montgomery and the newspaper uh, at the time reported that Henderson leaned out of the uh, cockpit of the aircraft and waved his handkerchief at the people below and was a little disappointed that they never waved back. He was a mile high, so I suspect they didn't really see him. Over in Anniston, the Army leased 19,000 acres of hilly land eight miles north of that town for a training camp because during the Spanish-American War, another camp, Camp Ship, S-H-I-P-P, -P, had been there. This became Camp and later Fort McClellan. It was secured by Congressman Fred Blackman. It opened in December of 1917 and hosted the 29th Infantry Division, the Blue and Gray, composed of troops from New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Virginia. In June 1918, the 29th Department De uh, departed for France, and it was replaced by African-American units, the Maryland National Guard 1st Separate Negro Company, the Ohio National Guard 9th Battalion of Infantry Colored. All of these units joined the 93rd Infantry Division under French command, and if you're a student of uh, troops in World War I, you probably know that the 93rd Infantry Division had a very good record. The 92nd had some problems, but the 93rd had an extraordinarily good record. Now let's look at some photos of camp life here at McClellan. Uh, you see in the upper left the so-called hostess house. There were rarely any decent hotels or places to stay. Uh, in or near these camps, and so every camp had a hostess house that was run by the wife of the camp commander. It was for uh, use by mothers and sisters and occasionally wives of uh, servicemen who were stationed at the camp. Upper right, you see trucks and mud. This is why the U.S. Army was not a mechanized army but was still a horse and mule army, it was because trucks were new at that period of time. On the lower left, you see a, resi a, re a regimental street. You see that there are wooden uh, housing units there. Uh, this made the camp into a cantonment, which meant that the army intended to stay put, which meant that federal funds would continue to flow into the neighborhood. And then we see a postcard. There were millions of these postcards um, sent uh, it was just uh, a postcard that you would send if you were uh, uh, stationed at Camp McClellan or someplace else. You would send this to your relatives to let them know that you uh, got there and you'd like some mail and to let them know that you were still alive and kicking. And it reads, if you would like to cheer me up and tickle me all through, just drop a line to Camp McClellan, Alabama. That's all you have to do. These postcards were exactly alike, regardless of where you were stationed. The only thing that changed was the uh, station's location. The camp in that uh, red pennant would change. Besides training camps and troops, the Great War benefited Alabama because of direct and contractual federal war spending. We're not going to look at all of it, but I want to look at uh, some. In Muscle Shoals in North Alabama, two companies built plants to extract nitrate from the air, a process made feasible in Germany in 1913. This was to replace the nitrates that were mined in Chile and used in munitions manufacturing. What makes a high explosive a high explosive? Nitrates. 
These two companies were called air nitrate and cyanamide. They needed enormous amounts of electricity to do their work. So in addition to building of air nitrate and cyanamide factories, the federal government began constructing the Wilson Dam that you see here in this postcard. The Wilson Dam was not finished until the late 1920s, and it became a contentious issue in Alabama politics when Henry Ford unsuccessfully pursued buying it in the mid-1920s. In fact, the electricity for the nitrate plants came from Alabama Power's coal-fired plant 24 miles south of Muscle Shoals in Moton, Alabama. These plants and the dam led to an enormous influx of workers that put an enormous strain on housing and the quote-unquote social arrangements the racial arrangements of Northwest Alabama as a whole. Rents skyrocketed. People were renting any interior space they could get, including huts and just rotten living facilities, dirt floor garages, any place to get inside. The Army built Liberty Village to house their body of technicians. Liberty Village still exists today. But many workers and their families, especially African Americans, lived in camps in the woods. Similar strains occurred in Mobile, which has suffered from the fall of cotton prices at the beginning of the war and a July 4th, 1916 hurricane that wrecked the docks and wrecked downtown. But the feds had contracted with five companies to come into Mobile, build shipyards, and produce merchant ships in the Upper Mobile Bay area. Only one of these companies, U.S. Steel, also built a company town, so the 10,000 and more workers flooded into Mobile. Many keels were laid, but no ships were completed before the armistice. Remember, we were only in the war for 19 months. A few rolled off the line by 1921 and were immediately decommissioned and sold to local shippers for pennies on the dollar. The Waterman uh, Transport Company uh, was created by buying these ships for pennies on the dollar and then using them around the world. These five companies were U.S. Steel, which operated as the Chickasaw Shipbuilding Company, and it built sh uh, steel ships in Chickasaw, Alabama, which still exists today. ADSCO, A-D-D-S-C-O, built steel ships out of the north end of Pinto Island, southeast of downtown Mobile. The Murren Company built wooden ships, the Ferris class wooden ship, devised in 1916. They built four of these. The Kelly Atkinson uh, Company of Chicago, building as the Mobile Shipbuilding Company, built what was called composite ships of steel frames with wooden uh, covering in a plant south of downtown, and the F.T. Lay Company that built ferro-concrete ships, including this one, the S.S. Selma. Ferro-concrete is exactly what it sounds like, reinforced concrete. The S.S. Selma became an oil tanker that cracked on a reef in Tampico in 1920, and after a whole bunch of of, of legal problems and lawsuits about ownership and what have you, then it was finally bought by the city of Galveston, and in 1922, it was sunk um, to become their uh, seawall. I believe you can still see part of this ship as the seawall today. Alabama civilians mobilized as the war progressed. Some of these... Uh, civilian mobilization core uh, are things we remember. The Red Cross, for example, the YMCA, the YWCA, the four-minute men and the four-minute women, and remember there were four-minute men for whites, four-minute men for blacks, four-minute women for whites, four-minute women for blacks. Possibly the U.S. Food Administration is something that you may remember. 
That was the starting point for Herbert Hoover's domestic political career that led directly to him becoming president in 1929. Others of these groups were local or ad hoc groups that formed for the single purpose and dissolved after the war. Some of these we have forgotten, and rightly so. The Council for National Defense, for example, the Alabama Council of Defense, uh, to which Governor Henderson inadvertently um, appointed ha, dead people, and the Women's Committee of the Council of National Defense uh, which, as of yet, does not really have a thorough study. The Alabama Council of Defense has at least a master's thesis. Here's an array of posters from that era. Most of these, I believe, were put out by the uh, Committee for Public Information. This is for the Four Minute Men. Four Minute Men, Four Minute Women uh, gave four-minute presentations wherever they could get an audience in movie theaters and Sunday school classes, anywhere there was some kind of civic meeting, they would get up and they'd make a pitch for one thing or another, uh, buy Liberty Bonds, those were the big ones. There were 52 specific speeches that the National CPI, the Committee for Public Information, sent out, and they delivered these things. Some of them were so, things like... Um, we don't have enough warm winter clothes for our soldiers in northern France, so please give us your minks and your heavy coats so we can dress our troops. Another was a call for binoculars that we couldn't produce enough of. So I have this little fantasy that maybe there was a mud-covered doughboy sticking his head up over the edge of a trench, holding up some lady's rhinestone-encrusted opera glasses um, trying to find the Germans in the other trenches and happy to have those things. Of course, that probably never happened. The American Red Cross. Here's one for the YMCA. You see on this one, the YMCA hut. Wherever you found any installation for the YMCA or any installation of American troops, you would find YMCA huts. The kind of the first thing they built. These were gathering places, community rooms for the troops in that place. Camp Sheridan, for example, had five YMCA huts. Then there were the Liberty Loans. Um, Alabama, the population of Alabama, surpassed their quota every time for all five of the Liberty Loans. The third Liberty Loan was the big Liberty Loan. And then my favorite, canned vegetables, fruit, and the Kaiser II. This is for the, um, uh, the U.S. Food Administration. We certainly cannot talk of Alabama history in this era without speaking of race. African Americans contributed mightily to the war effort, often by acquiescing in their community leaders' requests that they demonstrate hyper-patriotism. Many white Alabamians feared what we see here, armed and trained black men. These are not Alabama troops that we're looking at. Some local power elites in southwest Alabama Early in the war, wrote Governor Henderson, suggesting that all blacks be drafted into home labor units subject to military discipline and used on farms and in factories as needed. Not drafted into the military, drafted into home labor units that would be under the control of people like the guy that wrote this letter. This was completely contrary to uh, the Constitution. African Americans had good reasons to show their loyalty, to stop things like that, to stop the depredation um, of lynching, to stop that kind of extra uh, legal pressure on them. Most black troops from Alabama trained in service battalions at Camp Dodge, Iowa, and there's not yet a good historical study of those troops, similar to what Dr. Ruth Truss and Mr. Rod Frazier have produced for the 167th regiment. Another reason the African-American community demonstrated hyper-patriotism 
was that leaders like Booker T. Washington's successor after 1915, Robert Rousseau Moton, and his chief aide Emmett Scott believed that a show of support would create a new social contract in the United States. Hyperpatriotism would turn the tide of prejudice, they thought, and demonstrate that Alabama blacks were part of mainstream society. Thus, they thought, white Alabamians would finally grant full citizenship to blacks. They were not only wrong, but Moton had the indignity of being sent to France by President Wilson to inform African-American troops to not expect equal treatment when they refer, uh, returned home. In addition to citizens and the economy mobilizing, Alabama's political establishment responded to the war also. The legislature, uh, courtesy of the 1901 Constitution met quadrennially, that is every four years. It met in 1915 and 1919. Consequently, it missed the war altogether. And Governor Charles Henderson, who you see here on the left, refused to call a special session. Alabama barely coped with the organizational needs of the warfare state. Strain on the state even if the good things that happened, like the flood of federal money, was a difficult burden. We just didn't have the political or social or, or, or physical infrastructure to take care of this. Rejection rates of 17 to 30 percent of Alabama inductees into the military for disease and for being underweight embarrassed Alabama's elite, who still believed and told each other that any one Alabamian could whip any 10 Yankees, uh, I mean Germans, and they couldn't even get into the army at rates of 30%. Governor Charles Henderson consequently contracted with the Russell Sage Foundation to have sociologist H. H. Hart, who you see here on the right, conduct a social survey of the state in 1918. Leaks about this report emerged just prior to the 1918 election, and Hart delivered his findings in December. Though in encouraging tones, Hart's report made it clear that the local and state governments simply failed the people. Monies were misallocated. For example, we spent more on cattle tick eradication than we did on all public health needs combined, and the money was simply insufficient. Education had failed. Convict lease was not only a moral embarrassment, but had become an economic problem, and on and on and on. Governor Henderson could not run in 1918. Governors were held to one four-year term. But the Hart Report set in motion the progressive reforms of the winner, Thomas Kilby. Kilby had already begun running on a progressive platform that government could accomplish positive good for the people beyond what they could accomplish for themselves. Buttressed by the experience of the war and the Hart Report findings, Kilby became a progressive governor. He increased funding for education. He rewrote the education law. He oversaw increased appropriations to uh, human public health department. He secured all available federal funds to build a state system of highways. He couldn't get the highways built, but he could get the funds to do it. And he tried to get rid of the convict labor system. So now let's look at the very end. How did the state, how did communities memorialize the war in Alabama? Communities across the state often memorialize the war with a simple plaque or with by erecting a statue similar to the one seen here in this picture that I took from Eufaula. This particular one is a knockoff of the, the spirit of the American Doughboy uh, statue that was designed and sold by a fellow named E.M. Vicanay. But as a state, Alabama had a tough time erecting a memorial. The state decided to erect a living memorial, as it was called then, a useful building rather than a monumental building, and began fundraising. 
fundraising faltered with war weariness and because of a sudden and sharp post-war economic depression, and finally, because the fundraising leader, Alabama archivist Thomas Owen, died in 1920 kind of suddenly. Then 19 years later, in 1939, Marie Bankhead Owen, Thomas Owen's wife and his successor as state archivist, secured WPA funds to complete the current state archives War Memorial Building. And she did that by going to FDR's uh, chief economist and asking for the money with Governor Bib Graves. And the, the economist said, no, I don't think we're going to give you any money. So she said, I'll just go down from here in the White House down to Capitol Hill, where one of my brothers is uh, on the House Ways and Means Committee, and my other brother, a senator, is on the Senate's Finance Committee, and the economist uh, said, how much can I write you a check for? With that, then, I'll end the lecture. And as always, thanks for your attention.